Hi, I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine, and I'm here in San Jose, California at the 2009 Advanced Imaging Conference, better known as AIC. And I'm talking now with Peter Saravolo of Saravolo Optical Systems. And I should have a little editorial disclaimer here to say that uh, over the years I've talked to an awful lot of people in the imaging industry, but I've known Peter just about as long as anybody. We met many, many years ago at Stellafane, where we both had a mutual interest in astrophotography, particularly wide field astrophotography with medium format film. And as time went on and people started switching to digital imaging, uh, and many amateurs were clamoring for larger and larger digital chips, Peter was one of the first people that pointed out to me that you have to be careful what you wish for because the many optical systems that were available at the time really weren't good enough to cover a large format CCD with good SAR images. And to that end, Peter used a lot of his telescope making design abilities and his telescope making abilities to create his own optical systems that really are built for large format CCD imaging. One of the things that hadn't been a good match before was that the uh, anything that was capable of covering a larger format was very small aperture and that's kind of contradictory if you want to do really deep sky work so you were able to make a large aperture device that could cover a large format so yeah and in fact you know th this is a standard uh, it's essentially a Cassegrain telescope and one of the unique features of it is the fact that it's so short and the reason why it's so short is that we have a very fast primary mirror it's it's a very short focal length and and you can see here in the back where we have the CCD camera this is a um, Apogee Instruments one of their large format CCD cameras and you, can, you can see how huge it is relative to the instrument and the uh, the telescope itself is designed specifically for these large tips the focuser itself will not cut the field of view. The, the instrument itself has got apertures in the baffle tubes, etc., that allow all the light to come to a focus. All right, so you've got a basic Cassegrain system here. That's right. With a corrector in the back. That's right. There's a field corrector in the back because essentially, if you're going to cover a large format CCD, you're going to need lenses very close to the CCD to take out field curvature and some other things that happen with optics that degrade image quality. The aberrations that turn stars into seagulls at the edge exactly, of the field. Exactly, exactly. And so the interesting the interesting thing about this design is that it's a Cassegrain, but it was designed for large format from the beginning. And so you can take an existing instrument out there, put in a, and I've designed field correctors for them, where you uh, place them in the system as an, as an accessory. In fact, in this configuration, in this telescope, what we've done is made them integral to the instrument. What that allows us to do is to re-optimize everything, rebalance the optics and the work that they do in order to achieve the same effect. The result of re-optimizing the optics without the, uh, with the field correctors in place is that you can actually simplify the optical system, simplify the mirrors, where in fact the secondary is spherical, not aspheric, because most all other Cassegrain systems other have an aspheric secondary. That is problematic for alignment. That's a real big advantage. Yeah. yeah. In fact, you've got, in other words, unlike some of the other uh, more exotic optical systems that have extraordinarily critical alignments of the secondary mirror, having a spherical secondary lets you sort of simplify it, plus you've got a very unique design up here. In fact, yeah, the, the secondary uh, alignment um, features on this instrument are extremely unique. You find them in laboratories. You don't typically find them in amateur telescope mirrors. This is a pivot point, and these are the two adjustment screws. And so what you have is a, what's called an orthogonal alignment uh, cell where when you adjust this screw the, the mirror tilts this way when you adjust this screw the mirror tilts this way and so when the time comes to do a collimation in the field it's one movement moves the the stars in this direction the other movement moves the stars in the other direction and you know that and so it makes it so much easier yeah I know anybody that's ever done alignment on the, some of the three-point suspensions where yeah. you go twist you tighten one screw and an image goes off to the side then you try to figure out what the other screws are exactly. this is real straightforward you've got as you say the pivot points and orthogonal motions here just twist them move the star where you want it, plus the alignment's a lot simpler, a lot, lot less constraint on the, on the centering of the optic because There is no sphere. centering constraint. In fact, it's a sphere. It has no optical axis. All you need to do is tip and tilt. That's it. And, wow. we, and we basically center it mechanically here. It's within a few thousandths of an inch, but that's it. All you have to do in the field is just tip and tilt, and that's it. So if it goes bouncing along in the back of your car, yeah. you don't have to worry about 
being totally out of alignment when you set it up in the field. Yeah, it's really easy to, to, to finesse it in the field. And in fact, the primary mirror, what we also realized in, in prototype development is that the primary mirror needs to be fixed. It does not want to be adjustable. So we do precision alignment in the shop so that the customer, when they receive the telescope, using it is more of a pleasure than it is a chore. Because what we found is that if you can, if you can adjust something, it will go out of whack. <laughs> Okay. All right. I know you've got a couple of other features here that I want to bring up very quickly. Yeah. First of all, this is a native f4.9 optical system. That's right. So that's pretty fast for a 12 inch. That's right. It's a, is it 12 or 12 and a half? It's uh, 300 millimeters. 11.8 blah blah something something. Okay. <laughs> oh, those are. It's roughly 12 inches. It's 12 inches. Yeah. So it's f4.9. Yeah. But you, pen, you mentioned before you've got an optical corrector in the back. Yeah. You've got another corrector right here that installs in place of the one that's in there now, and that, that's right. that does what to this instrument? Well, uh, the native configuration, as you mentioned, is at 4.9. It wants to be fast for wide field. I also wanted to do high resolution imaging that covers the same large format detector, and so I designed uh, another field corrector that has negative amplifying power. Essentially, it magnifies the image, and so that you can get wide field, uh, well, high resolution yeah. with, with and maintaining the coverage over the large detector. And this is actually quite unique in astronomy today. Yeah. So this brings it up to an F9. F9, that's right. So that's a, how long a focal length? That's uh, 2,700? 20, 2,700 millimeters. 2,700 millimeters. Yeah. Covering a full, the full large format ships. 38 millimeter square, that's right. Uh, all right, and you've got other advantages as well. You've got a lot of back focus in here, so it looks like there's plenty of room for no matter what camera you've got for filter wheels. That's right. All right, and uh, you've got necessary adapters to move these things out. You can yeah. adjust this. And we can, you can adjust the back, you know, the position of the camera by you know, inserting spacer rings in there so that you get just the optimal position for the configuration that you're using with the accessories. And of course, you can, you can essentially bolt on anything to the back that yep. works. The other interesting feature about this instrument is the fact that we've made integral to the instrument electronics yeah. that controls the thermals and the focuser. All right, so explain to me, let, let people know a little bit about what that, what that does. You've got heaters on the primary mirror. Yeah. You've got heaters on the secondary mirror. Yeah. All right, yep. you've got thermal couples to measure the ambient temperature of the tube. That's right. All right, so you're, you're aiming to keep the optics very close to the ambient temperature. So that they don't do over. So no do. No do. And also, and also and if, if the optics are hot at the beginning of the observing session, the controller basically turns on the fans. So it cools it down. So in yeah. other words, and you said to me before, it's an autonomous system. That's right. It's aimed, at, it measures the ambient temperature, and it does what it needs to do to get those optics within about two degrees of that ambient temperature so they That's won't right. do over, and they'll give you your best images possible. Exactly. It also serves to protect the aluminum coatings, the, the reflective coatings on the optics, because when they get dewed over, you get acid yeah. dew nowadays, and it, it eats away at the coating. So if you can prevent that from happening prolongs the life of the coatings. Okay, and so the electronics that are built into the, the telescope not only control the thermal characteristics of the instrument, it also controls a focuser as well as some auxiliary stepper motors for actuating um, uh, rotators, etc. And so it's all integral to the instrument so that you minimize the amount of cabling at the telescope which really helps in the cold weather because cables become very stiff, et cetera. So we, we try to integrate as much, as much functionality into the instrument as possible. Unless cables are great for the autonomous systems that are all computer exactly. slewed, you don't want to have a cable hanging off and catching on some exactly. whatever. Now, the thing is, the focus of that you're supplying with the instrument, you were telling me before, it's all kind of a modular system. That's right. So if, if somebody wanted to have a different focuser, can you accommodate that? Yeah, absolutely. The, the focuser attaches to the back end of the telescope through an interface plate. And so you can have, this is an Optech 3-inch focuser, you can have a, uh, an FLI focuser, you can have any focuser you want. You can have uh, a rack and pinion, you can have Crayford, it doesn't matter. And it's configurable uh, to a customer's needs. Peter, I want to thank you for telling me about your high-performance imaging telescope. I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine here at the 2009 AIC Conference in San Jose, California. So, Peter.